Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us for today's event, the role of the private sector in advancing self-care. And I would, I would like to invite you to please introduce yourself in the chat box by entering your name, affiliation, country of residence, and share briefly why you joined us today. Today's event is sponsored by the Self-Care Trailblazer Group, Global Advocacy and Communication Working Group, and the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, Market Development Approaches Working Group. I am Sarah Malaba. I'm a seasoned public health practitioner with 20 years of experience in designing and executing large complex multi-funded uh, public health interventions in Africa. Since February of 2021, I've led the strengthening HIV self-testing in the private sector project, we call it SHIPS, at the Population Services International. The SHIPS project is a three-year CIF-funded project implemented in Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda that aims to grow the private sector market for HIV self-testing with a public health impact. The project is currently in the pilot phase following its market research that revealed barriers and facilitators to the uptake of HIV self-testing in the private sector and the success is leveraging public-private partnerships to advance HIV self-care. I will be your moderator for this important conversation today and I'm excited to be with you to explore how the different experiences and perspectives of our panelists can help shine light on ways that the private sector can and should contribute to the health system and universal health coverage. We know that the private health sector plays an essential role in all areas related to health. In most countries, private pharmacies play an instrumental role in people receiving access to health products. The private sector also develops, manufactures, and distributes the self-care products that we use. The aim of today's discussion is to explore the relationship between the private sector and the health system and how they can better advance self-care products. We want you to leave this conversation with a better understanding of the role the private sector plays in advancing self-care and how we can advance self-care within universal health coverage. We have an engaging panel discussion with representatives from the private sector and a Ministry of Health official who will share how they were able to advance their self-care products with other private sector stakeholders. We have a lot of people registered for this event from every region, actually more than 600 people registered for this event. And again, I want to invite you to please introduce yourself in the chat box by entering your name, affiliation, country of residence, and also share with us briefly why you joined today. We want to hear from you throughout this meeting. And as we begin this discussion, please share your questions in the chat. We'll be collecting this throughout the chat and try to ask our panelists as many questions as possible. So I want to invite you to please engage. Okay, so let me take a few minutes to share with you a brief background on our two organizations. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Self-Care Trailblazer Group, we are a global coalition consisting of hundreds of members across more than 65 countries that is dedicated to expanding the safe and effective practice of self-care. Please join us if you aren't already a member. We have put the registration form in the chat box and I'm asking my team to please enable the chat. I can see some comments that some participants are not able to access the chat box. Next slide, next slide, please. I'm going to take you through the mission of the Reproductive Health Services Coalition, which is also a global partnership of over 550 public, private, and non-governmental organizations dedicated to ensuring that all people in low and middle income countries can access and use affordable health, high quality supplies to ensure their better reproductive health. We always welcome new organizational members. And again, we are placing the link um, 
of this organization in the, in the chat box. We're placing the link for your organization to join the coalition in the chat. We're also putting the link for individuals to join our working groups or caucuses there. Next slide, please. So as we start, um, let me go over some few ground rules, actually just two to ensure that we all get the maximum benefit uh, of today's meeting. So one, because we're inviting you to participate, share your thoughts, your views and questions in the chat box, taking care to be respectful to each other. And then two, this is a space where all ideas and inputs are very much welcome. Next slide, please. So let me take this chance to introduce our three panelists. Today, we are joined by Jacqueline Ann Maimin, who graduated with distinction from the Rhodes University and is a pharmacist with 35 years working experience in the health sector, specifically in the pharmaceutical industry. Jackie is a past chairman of Western Cape branch of the Pharmaceutical Society of South Africa and is a fellow of the PSSA. She's an elected member of the South African Pharmacy Council, serving her second term where she chairs the practice committee. Jackie was a founding director of the Independent Community Pharmacy Association, ICPA, and is currently their CEO. Jackie believes that community pharmacy is ideally positioned to positively contribute to the health and well being of the people of South Africa and will be a critical primary care provider under NHI. Welcome, Jackie. Next is Brian Reid of Orashua. Brian Reid is an international vice president at Orashua Technologies, responsible for the company's global infectious disease businesses outside the USA. He has over 40 years commercial experience in the in vitro diagnostic sector, having worked with a number of leading diagnostic companies before joining Orashua Technologies 14 years ago. At Orashua, he developed the Oraquick HIV self-test, the first self-test to gain WHO pre-qualification, which is currently used in around 95 countries in the world. His experience spans most disciplines of laboratory diagnostics, supplying testing solutions ranging from large-scale automated laboratory diagnostic systems to single-use rapid self-tests. Thank you for joining us here today, Brian. I also would like to invite and welcome uh, Mr. Geoffrey Tassi, who is a public health and HIV prevention specialist, currently working at the AIDS Control Division of the Ministry of Health in Uganda. Mr. Tassi has experience spanning 15 years. His roles include the HIV testing uh, uh, services policy and strategy, coordination and capacity building, strategic information research and innovations. He has steered the policy reviews and the adaptations of optimized differentiated HIV testing services in Uganda. He has authored and co-authored 29 peer-reviewed publications in renowned journals. He has championed the introduction of HIV self-testing in Uganda for both the public and the private sector. Tassi is passionate about innovation and implementation science to improve health outcomes. He sits on 10 national technical working groups uh, including the National Self-Care Expert Group and four global technical working groups. A warm welcome to all our panelists. So let's dive into the questions, uh, which is really the, the gist of this webinar. And I'm going to pose a, to a question to all the panelists and invite them to respond to this first question. What role do you think the private sector can play in advancing self-care products as part of a universal health coverage plan? Shall I go ahead, Sarah? Yes, please. Okay. So I believe the private sector has a vital role to play. Um, healthcare professionals and services are under severe pressure to be able to deliver quality healthcare globally. Um, and in fact, just recently in October, our Minister of Health um, delivered a speech where he stated that the healthcare worker shortage is threatening the quality and sustainability of health systems in Africa and worldwide. 
Now, as countries strive to achieve um, universal health coverage, it is absolutely apparent that we need to embrace every single resource that is available. And I believe the private sector has capacity and a willingness to adapt to the new models of care, especially as we move away from the old curative models to a more preventative and self-care type modeling. Now, in this new model, um, healthcare professionals need to be able to educate and empower individuals to take more responsibility for their own well-being. And pharmacy, being one of the most accessible healthcare resources, is ideally positioned to support people with regard to self-care, advising on treatments for things like minor ailments, um, and supplying the variety of different self-care products and services out there. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. Would you like to weigh in, Brian or Geoffrey? Hello. Hi. Hello. Sorry. Um, it's Brian here. My apologies for my technical challenges this morning. Um, hopefully, you can hear me OK. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I, I personally, I think the private sector has has a huge role to play in in, in developing um, more personal care, if you like. And, and in fact, it's already occurring in in many countries and was significantly enhanced by uh, or during the the COVID crisis. I think private health companies are now well versed in interacting with with the public in terms of. Uh, collecting information, sending sending collectors or tests, and receiving samples um, uh, after analysis, sending results out to to individuals and also to to government bodies. So, I think that's that 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 is well developed. And I, one thing I noticed as I travel around the world is that after COVID, these private organisations are expanding to a more comprehensive healthcare package, usually driven by technology and um, and a, and a comprehensive lab service. From a diagnostic standpoint, certainly, or an our standpoint, Orishio's experience is, is, has largely been in the self-testing space, um, making it simple to use non-invasive tests for, for people to use in, uh, in the privacy of their own home or wherever they want to, to test. But, and that's both in the public sector and in the consumer space. Um, Currently, our products are um, the Oroquick HIV self-test um, and uh, IntelliScope COVID antigen self-test, which are very simple to use um, tests. And you could imagine our expanding that into a range of simple diagnostic tests for other disease states designed primarily for, for consumer personal use. Um, some diseases, for example, sexually transmitted infections, rapid tests don't work. and, and the next route for self-care, I think, is is, is self-sampling. Uh, we do have, through our subsidiary company, DNA Genetech, we do have self-sampling sampling options for different types of tests. But that's a very different service provision. Um, but still, self-sampling devices have to be fit for purpose. They have to be packaged and labelled appropriately. And there has to be a mechanism to get that sample back to the lab quickly to retain the integrity of the sample. And I would assume some, some software needs to be in place to get the results back to the to the individual so that they could build that health health profile. So I think the products and services to create this sort of universal personal health coverage do exist, both in the private um, and in the public space, perhaps mainly in, in large, in, uh, in higher income countries. I, I think in low and middle income countries, certainly in the near term, the public health system continues to play a critical role in providing that central service um, and, and coordinating services with the private sector as and when needed. This interaction between public and private sector providers, I think, is going to be key as this whole thing develops. Thank you, Brian. And both you and Jackie just underscore that indeed the private sector has a role to play, not only in bridging gaps, positioning um, products, making sure products are available, but also um, then they have a critical role 
uh, when we also think about the need for coordination between the public and the private sector. One of our panelists, Mr. Geoffrey Tassi, is going to be joining shortly. Um, and so we will and continue. Sir, just to say that Jeffrey is now on the line. Okay, great. Welcome, welcome, Geoffrey. Would you like to give us your view on what role the private sector can play in advancing self-care products as part of a universal health coverage plan? Yes, hello. Jeffrey, you are on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yes. So apologies for joining in late. I've been trying to join uh, with little success. Yeah, so um, I, I think I'll speak um, in relation to uh, Uganda, especially uh, the role of the private sector in terms of advancing um, uh, uh, self care. So for Uganda, one of the things we know is that over 50% of the population actually does access um, uh, care uh, from the private sector. Uh, and for us, that is a very huge um, uh, implication when it comes to care generally, but also when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to self-care, but, but also we do have uh, many people, especially uh, here in Africa, people like uh, the over-the-counter uh, pickup, you know, of uh, health products. So self-care uh, uh, brings in another dynamic of, uh, you know, uh, 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 people being able to, to access care um, at their convenience, um, even at community level and affordable, uh, at an affordable price. So, so to me, the private sector, uh, like I say, about 60% of Ugandans actually do access a care from the private sector. So the private sector reaches more people uh, than the public sector. And what that means is that they are more close uh, to the people, um, almost the split is half half and therefore uh, they are such a big partner that one cannot ignore when it comes to uh, uh, self uh, self care but but also the other thing is that uh, people do do believe they do believe um in their uh, healthcare providers especially those that are closest to them uh, and uh, the, the private sector uh, comes with that kind of uh, um, uh, arrangement because we have those small clinics, drug shops in the communities, deep in the community that uh, people simply run to uh, for care. So the private sector uh, comes in as a game changer, especially in advancing, in expanding, in scaling up our self-care to reach the populations uh, that we want to reach. Yeah. Um, uh, and of course, what, one of the other things that we have quite a variety of products in the private sector uh, in most countries, which are not uh, even in the public sector. Uh, and that's one uh, kind of, uh, of partnership that we need to have with the private sector so that all the products, all the medical uh, devices that um, um, uh, go through to the private sector are uh, actually approved are of quality to protect other consumers. So I see a very good opportunity for us government to partner with the private sector to protect both the consumer, but, but also to uh, stop the counterfeits especially, which uh, also affects uh, the private sector uh, 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 business. So we are protecting the consumer but it's also an advantage uh, for the private sector. Yes. Yeah, thanks, thank Sarah. You. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. I think you've added a very critical point about the complementarity of the private sector and indeed pointing out that for the case of Uganda, it actually reaches the majority of the consumers 
providing greater choice and also opening up access. Coming off from your point around the pharmacies and the whole issue around um, the need to have controls so that there's quality products within the private sector. My next question is directed to Jackie. Private sector, uh, private pharmacies play an essential role in people receiving access to health products. Do you see any challenges related to availability of self-care products in private pharmacies? And if so, what is the, what is the private with the primary challenge and how do we overcome that as a community? Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Indeed, um, yes, they play a very big role in terms of uh, having the products reach the people. But uh, like I did mention, one of the threats that we we see, um, especially here, I'm not sure how the other countries um, are finding this, but one of the threats that we have a lot of um, cheap uh, products, that are actually not approved. Uh, the prices are so cheap, you know, they are so low compared to the approval products. An example is HIV cell testing, uh, for example. So you kind of have about four approved uh, test kits that are WHO pre-qualified, but also uh, have been um, evaluated in country and approved by the National Drug Authority and the Ministry of Health. But beside those, then you have are so many others that are not yet that, that are not actually anywhere uh, on the WHO list. Neither has Uganda uh, approved them, but they find themselves. Uh, uh, they just find their way into the country through our porous uh, our borders. So, so one of the one of the challenges is actually that. So the the private uh, providers, the pharmacies and clinics. Uh, are finding a challenge in stocking the approved products because they are way uh, expensive compared to the cheap products uh, from everywhere. So what we are trying to do as government, working with the National Drug Authority, is to strengthen the component of regulation, but, but, so, but also to make it easy uh, for the approved products to be registered here. Because previously it was taking about um, six months and now within uh, three months, you can have your products fully uh, registered in Uganda and you can access uh, the market. So we want to make sure that the environment, the regulatory environment is favorable um, for the players, the private players who want to access the market with uh, the approved products. And also we are working with the Revenue Authority, the National Bureau of Standards and other stakeholders to assure that we uh, stop the poor quality, the non-approved products uh, from coming in here. The other thing we would try to do is uh, to work with the manufacturers, uh, especially um, Orashua for, for self-testing, to assure that the private sector also enjoys the subsidy that the Bill Gates Foundation had extended uh, to the governments in Sub-Saharan Africa because at first the kits were way too expensive. And uh, our belief is that, you know, whether you access in the private sector or public sector, you are actually Ugandan and you're benefiting uh, uh, from this uh, uh, self-care uh, commodity. So we are looking at the regulation, but we are looking at also price. We are looking at increasing uh, choices and we are looking at uh, assuring that there is quality, both in the private and in the public sector, the quality assured. Uh, uh, products. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Geoffrey. Uh, Jackie, I will still turn this question back to you. I think um, Geoffrey has spoken to us a lot about the context in Uganda and more specifically around HIV self testing. He notes the big challenge around the non pre qualified kits, the pricing of um, the, the cheaper prices around the unapproved kits, as well as um, you know, reduction of the registration process timelines and maybe the costs associated are some of the challenges and also ways of overcoming um, some of these challenges. I'd like to turn over this question to you so that you can speak to us a little bit more uh, from your experience. What do you see as some of the additional challenges related to availability of self-care products that could be broader than just HIV self-testing? And uh, 
What do you think is the primary challenge and how do we overcome that? Okay, th thanks very much. Thanks, Jeffrey, for answering my question as well. So, um, Sarah, I think um, speaking as well to HIV self um, testing kits, some of the challenges we had in South Africa were that a lot of the professional kits were being sold as self testing kits, which of course they are not. They are not user friendly and you could end up with um, incorrect results, especially false positives. So um, I think the main challenge we had with the self testing, um, the HIV self screening test kits was price. Um, they were too expensive, which is why the market got flooded with the professional kits. So you can get a professional kit for 10 Rand, but the um, self testing kits were over 200 Rand. And so I know PSI has been doing a lot of work at bringing those prices down. We absolutely need to make them affordable. Otherwise, even if the pharmacies have them, they, they're not accessible to the people. But I think one of the main challenges that we have um, in South Africa is um, when we, we need task shifting. So there are a lot of products um, that we would that are on the WHO list of possible self-care products, which are scheduled um, in South Africa. And so as pharmacists, we don't have access to those. And examples here are your medicines for termination of pregnancy, our PEP, PrEP and first line ARVs, and even our oral contraceptives. Now we do here in South Africa have um, through our statutory council, we can do supplementary training, which gives us access to these higher scheduled medicines. Um, which means that we can then um, assist people to self-care with these particular products. Now, the biggest challenge we're having at the moment, we were initiating something called pharmacist-initiated management of antiretroviral therapy, which was a follow-on from NIMOT, which is the nurse-initiated management of ART. Um, now, NIMOT has been extremely successful in South Africa. I think we all know that South Africa has got the largest treatment program for HIV or people living with HIV. And about 80% of people living with HIV in South Africa are actually managed by nurses. So this was a very successful um, case of task shifting. And um, pharmacists uh, got training, but then we were blocked um, by several um, GP groupings who felt that it was the scope of a, of a general practitioner and not the scope of a pharmacist. So I think some of the challenges we have is we need more advocacy to be able to um, increase this. I think the whole idea of pharmacists, for instance, being able to do PEP and PrEP was that they are difficult to reach populations. The men and young women don't tend to go into the clinics and they don't go and visit doctors, but they do come into pharmacies. I mean, we, we see here in South Africa, in the private sector, about 100,000 emergency contraceptive scripts filled every month. That means we're seeing a man and a young woman who um, are at risk of, of HIV and that we could be talking to about PrEP. Um, but the problem is that we don't have access to these particular um, medicines. So, as I say, I think the primary challenge is access to these medicines um, from a pharmacy perspective, um, access to training, if there is political will to allow this task shifting. Um, so we need a lot more advocacy work um, and we need support from our Minister of Health. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think very well articulated. And they sound like, you know, there's a lot of work around the policy level and operating environment that we need to work on that will also uh, gain with a lot of support in terms of advocacy. I'm going to turn the next question to Brian. And Brian, you bring a wealth of experience in product development. Please describe how the different aspects of your product development cycle are impacted by the fact that your product is meant for self-care or self-administration. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it's quite an interesting story, actually. If I could take the HIV self-test as an example. Um, we actually started our development of the HIV self-test in around 2006, 2007, um, really to 
try and change the mindset around um, reaching those people who are not engaging with with, with, the, with the healthcare provision. Um, and I think the fact that HIV was beginning to be considered no longer a death sentence kind of relaxed uh, some people's attitudes towards testing for HIV. We did have a test designed for clinical use, uh, for use with both blood and oral fluid, the Oroquick HIV test. And But the, the oral fluid non-invasiveness um, it was really ideal for the consumer. Um, we we did get US FDA approval for the Oracle in home HIV test in 2012, and that required a huge amount of clinical work and, and lobbying to to change uh, to change the opinion. But I think that acceptance by the US FDA really was pivotal in changing attitudes ar- around the world. Um, we were also fortunate as we began to develop a product for outside the US in being involved in the the STAR program, um, which was really groundbreaking in setting HIV self-test policy in low and middle income countries and and actually helping us really identify what an HIV self-test or any self-test would look like. Um, We knew, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, had you finished? I'm sorry. No, I, I was I was just going to say we 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 had a product that um, we knew performed well, um, but we had to develop the packaging, um, the instructions for use. People who are going to use a self test need to be able to understand the instructions, and we had to um, d- develop different uh, translations, many many different languages. Um, to get a product that could, people could actually interact with and use use correctly, um, we needed to perform clinical studies with laypersons. We hadn't had to do that before for our clinical use products. Um, so essentially, we had to design a, a consumer pro, uh, product, still observing appropriate regulatory guidelines and our own stringent quality requirements. And, and that comes up when you think about other products. Um, and also how we got, just lastly, how we... Um, got the product to to the, the the population that needed it, whether it be through public health or through pharmacies. Pharmacies as a key role, as was mentioned earlier, um, they play a key role as advisors and in, in in training and interacting with the public. So we had to get more involved with the pharmacists and and finally, just the marketing of the product is very very different. Um, we have to begin to interact with consumers which um, typically we're not very good at in the diagnostic space, but even using our words, like we would use sensitivity and specificity, for example, that doesn't resonate with the public. So we had that whole learning process to to go through. Great. Thank you for outlining for us, um, you know, the process that it took and the different aspects, which really boil down to what I can hear you saying, consumer-powered care, how do you facilitate you know, self-care and self-administration, and that really impacted on how you're thinking about the product, for example, the translations around the instructions for use, and also the engagement with the pharmacy, who is really the provider that is facing the client, especially the client that comes into the public, the private sector. I will shift the next question to Mr. Geoffrey Tassi. Uganda is a leader in the self-care movement. In Uganda, how is the Ministry of Health working with or partnering with the private sector on this aspect of self-care products? And may you please outline for us some strong examples of the public-private sector partnerships in Uganda that we could all learn from? Thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, so in Uganda, one of the uh, things we, we are trying to do is to uh, standardize, of course, having self-care as a standardized additional um, care uh, intervention on top of the other existing uh, provider um, care uh, interventions or professional uh, services uh, provided by the uh, healthcare providers. So want to standardize this. Uh, and I'm glad to say that we have actually been uh, developing our national self-care guidelines uh, and we've made sure that the interests of the private sector are really taken care of 
um, as we develop the guidelines. So we have our first uh, draft of guidelines, which we just piloted. And uh, we, we're just going to the field to uh, pick more data and in another round of um, our supervision. We want to make sure that uh, by the time we launch the self-care guidelines, uh, we are almost certain that um, everyone is really, really well taken care of and that all that could be uh, issues and barriers uh, to care, uh, self-care, are actually addressed. So we want to have a standard that works for everyone, uh, both in the private and public sector. Uh, and to us, that is a very, very uh, big milestone uh, in the history of self-care uh, in Uganda. And the, the number two, um, like I mentioned, the other thing we, we are working on is the uh, public-private partnership. So at the Ministry of Health, we have a desk uh, for public-private partnership, uh, coordination. Um, so already there are players, there are distributors, there are organizations that have memorandum of understanding with uh, the Ministry of Health. Uh, in terms of collaboration um, for both professional uh, and self-care. Usually MOU stand for three years, uh, two, three years. So in that kind of partnership, uh, everyone's expectation, especially from the side of government and then the side of uh, the, the, the private uh, uh, providers, private uh, sector player, are well defined uh, um, to, to ensure that uh, self care or to ensure that care in the private the private sector is not just looking at uh, profits but is also looking at the public health or the public or the public health uh, outcomes uh, of a particular a particular intervention. Of course. Um, there are issues around um, measuring the contribution of um, the private sector, especially bit self-care, bit professional care, the, the contribution of the private sector um, to public health uh, interventions. For example, talk about the HIV response, uh, talk about malaria, uh, talk about um, other epidemics like TB, there are questions on how to measure uh, the contribution of that. But once you have, uh, and of course we are trying to, to develop, uh, to, to do pilots, uh, and I'm glad that South Africa also uh, tried out the, 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 um, the pharmacy model for ARVs. We, we are doing that here as well. Uh, and I think we are in the scale up phase to, to, to work with pharmacies and uh, SIPO can, can, can access ARVs. Uh, and the same thing, the same model is being used for HIV self-testing uh, with um, uh, the STAR 3 project to avail our government's uh, kits through the private sector. Uh, and there's a streamlined way of how people can access them uh, uh, through there. So there's quite a lot, uh, a lot happening. Um, recently, we, we, we just had uh, another uh, interesting uh, contribution from the private sector from one of the partners. We, we, had, we had a training gap um, and we spoke to one of the distributors uh, if they could support training because providers were not training in, 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 trained in some regions and uh, no. um, the demand for, for, for the products was actually quite low. Uh, and they did. Uh, through our public-private uh, partnership, uh, they did this. For World Aid Day, we are also working with another uh, distributor to have um, a self-testing run in universities uh, across the country, uh, uh, universities uh, around uh, the city. I think about six universities are going to benefit from this. And th that is a uh, corporate social responsibility the private sector. So they are going to give us self-test kits. We take them to the university students. Uh, two weeks preceding the World AIDS Day, we, we hope to reach about 5,000 uh, 5, university students. The kits are all provided 
by the distributors. So these are examples of uh, how government can work with uh, the private sector to adverse uh, self-care, um, to, to ensure that people do access uh, self-care, they do uh, utilize, um, um, but, but also um, uh, uh, contributes to the bigger uh, public health uh, outcomes uh, and also ending these uh, huge public health challenges like HIV, uh, TB, malaria, uh, and also the unmet need uh, for family planning. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Tassi. I want you to keep in mind um, from this conversation, just going off the points that you have given, I, in my next few questions, I'm going to be asking you to share with us what works, what makes these public-private partnerships in Uganda possible. So think about it and uh, be ready just to share with us some key nuggets. What should other countries do to be able to replicate uh, this kind of strong public-private partnerships that you have in Uganda for, for service delivery? And I'm going to now ask the next question to Brian. Given your expertise in self-care diagnostics, do you have lessons learned in successfully scaling up um, the sales and distribution of your self-care tests, especially in LMICs that can be applied to other self-care products? We always have this big question around preparing for scale, especially when you think about the private sector, because it's quite different when you think about the public sector. So I'm looking forward to hearing if you have any lessons that you could share with us in terms of scaling up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we actually learned a huge amount um, with the, the experience we've had from, from our uh, Oracle HIV uh, self-test. And in fairness, we've been able to use that experience to quickly develop our IntelliSwap COVID antigen uh, self-test and, and bring that to, to market. So I think looking forward, in general, we're better positioned to to consider things like product design, um, the regulatory landscape. What what do we need to do for different countries in order to get our product into the marketplace, and also the mode of distribution. Um, and when you mentioned the private sector, it's you know do we sell through pharmacies? Um, we've we've had some experience in in distributing our product through vending machines. Um, which is another interesting um, mode of, of delivery. But you touched on it earlier. There's also this willingness to pay. And that, that, that I think, is key. Uh, and certainly, as we develop the HIV self-test space, we kind of gained our experience as we went through it, as sounds fairly obvious. But at least we can now sit back and say, OK, if we're going to go into the market with a new marker, what is this going to look like? Uh, and I think that um, we'll benefit from that. I think overall, our lessons, you know, users who are going to engage with a self-test or a self-care product of some description need to have confidence uh, in that product and they need to easily interact with it. So I think simplicity is really, really important. I mentioned the, 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 the instructions in different languages and, and you know, I think we've got about 60 different iterations now. That builds credibility and I think the more confident people are in using a product, they're more likely to use it and continue to use it and advise other people that they should be using it. Um, one thing we did find, and I think Jackie touched on it earlier on, when people are empowered to use, a, in our case, a diagnostic test or a healthcare product, they tend to want to mo know more about it rather than just relying on a, a, a counsellor or a, a, cl a, a clinician. They, so we, we have to provide more information that's written in language that people can understand on, on you know, what we're testing for and why it's working and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that was probably something we didn't, uh, realize right at the beginning, but I think it's it's quite important. In terms of just the manufacturing, um, the one thing is clear is, yes, we've got different language iterations, we've got different product put-ups for different countries. Countries want hotline numbers printed on the instructions or on the package. They want special, mes special messages put on the, the outside of the pack. 
that's incredibly challenging um, in terms of logistics, in terms of manufacturing process, and in terms of cost. And I think that's something that, uh, as a manufacturer, we've got to, we've got to get better at because it does impact uh, impact cost. And, and there's very different from the sort of traditional clinical use diagnostic product. Um, going back, if I may, just for one second, going back to this quality thing and confidence in the result, it was mentioned by both Jackie and Jeff, the, the sale of non-regulated, not even self-tests, cheaply through commercial outlets, pharmacies and the like, really has to be clamped down on because that I'm very passionate about that. I think with all the building that we've done over the years to, to get to this stage with, with self-care, these sort of products can seriously undermine all the good work that's been um, been done to date. So we, there's a lot of things. We, I mentioned engaging with the pharmacists earlier on. That is a very, very important um, vector, if you like, to get the product to the people. Um, the, the, they are seen with trust in the community. Uh, and I think that we've got to engage with them more to make sure they're aware of the product, they understand more about the product such that they can give advice. Um, and of course, we, we spoke about price earlier, the pharmacist is responsible for the end price to the consumer. And we've been able, we've been fortunate that in a number of countries we've been able to work with the pharmaceutical or the pharmacy society, excuse me, um, to at least set a reasonable price um, to the end user such that there's not huge margins being loaded on to, to healthcare products at pharmacies, at pharmacies. And I think that's that's really, really important. And that's why the, the whole expectation of affordability uh, at the, at right from the start is uh, is really important for any manufacturer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you for sharing the good in terms of what leads to a successful scale up, but also pointing us to the biggest kind of risk uh, when we think about scaling up self-care products, which is really the regulatory environment. From our experience, we have seen that as we create demand for pre-qualified products or quality assured products, the demand for non-pre-qualified products also then goes up because then pricing and availability becomes an issue. And from the WHO guidelines, it is clear that, you know, when we talk about self-care, we really must be clear around availing a quality product or a quality service and ensuring that that service actually provides for accuracy. And so um, I just want to put that the biggest challenge, I think, to scaling up self-care products and self-care services is going to be that regulatory environment that really clamps down um, on non-quality assured uh, products and also non-quality assured services. And on that note, I'd like to ask Jackie a similar question, but with a view on pharmacies. What do you see as the incentives for private pharmacies to support scale up of self-care products? Especially when we think about what Brian has just outlined that the pharmacist is ultimately responsible for the price to the end user. <laughs> Yeah, and price is, is a sensitive issue when you come to a client who wants to purchase in the private sector, and they would often use price as a, as a factor of choice. Absolutely. Um, and yes, I, I hear exactly what Brian is saying there. Um, however, in South Africa, certainly um, selling or dispensing through pharmacies is highly regulated. And in fact, we have a maximum fee, which is stipulated by our um, statutory council through a pricing committee. So you, you don't get this, these sort of extortionary high um, prices. Um, saying that, I think for, for us, for private pharmacies, I think there's so much more that we can do in promoting self-care. And I believe that the um, incentive is there um, a lot of, as I've said to you before, some of the barriers for us is access to some of these self-care um, products, be that other healthcare professionals guarding their scopes of practice um, or affordability. But I think as well, um, a, a great incentive for private care um, pharmacies would be access to state patients. So here in South Africa, we've got a two-tier health system, unfortunately. 
Um, we have about 9 million insured people who purchase their medicines funded by medical schemes through private hospitals and pharmacies. And then we have 51 million people who either self-fund or have to go to state facilities. And our state facilities are under huge pressure to try and uh, be able to look after the vast majority of the population of South Africa. And interestingly enough, it's about the same resources in the private sector and the public sector. So we've got this complete skewing. So there is um, ability and capacity in the private sector to help a lot more. And I think a great incentive for us to be able to empower uninsured people, to educate them, to get them um, medically literate would be to give us access to these patients. So setting up public-private partnerships, um, allowing us to access state medicines, and they would all be with service level agreements, so prices would be agreed upon, um, almost as you say, a universal health coverage. And I think this would be a huge incentive for uh, pharmacies. But aside from that, it's access to some of these self-care products that we currently don't have access to. And that requires supplementary training, perhaps permitting to expand our scope of practice so that we can do, and as I mentioned before, termination of pregnancy, PrEP, PEP, first line ARVs, family planning, injectable and um, oral, just to name a few. And I mean, just those services alone we, we do have some public-private partnerships with provincial um, uh, departments of health, and they have been extremely successful. Um, and I think we need to roll out more of those. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'm going to put you on the spot for just one minute. When you talk about access to products and access to patients, and you talk about the incentive around accessing the state products, how do you see this working? Because in a few countries, what I've had, the hesitancy is around, then how will the private pharmacies make money? Uh, because there's a markup on the products or maybe people will need to pay for consultation services. How do you think this, this would work? And of course, I'm realizing that, you know, South Africa is sort of our model when we talk about public private partnerships and, you know, incentives around the private pharmacies. Absolutely. And um, so, so what I'll do is I will base this on my experience. Um, so in the Western Cape, in the early 1990s, we rolled out a public private partnership was that uh, pharmacies, pharmacists did training, we got permits to be able to supply um, contraceptives. And we acquired the state um, oral contraceptives and injectables at no cost. And we passed those on at no cost but they did not pay for our services. So what we did was we paid a small consultation fee. So as a, an uninsured person, you could come to, for instance, my pharmacy, I would be able to give you oral contraceptives or the depots, and I would charge you a small consultation fee, almost like a convenience fee. And Sarah, what I can tell you is that within um, a year, I had 2000 state patients the convenience of being able to just walk into a pharmacy, maybe at lunchtime in their lunch break, get their injection, pay 50 Rand and walk out. It was absolutely worth it. And we must remember that accessing state um, services is not free. People have to take time off work because the queues are so long. They have to catch a taxi to these facilities and catch a taxi back. And in fact, a survey was done here in South Africa that to access free medicine actually costs about 230 Rand. So as a pharmacist, I was charging 50 Rand to do family planning, and that was a bargain. And I had so many state patients, and it was a great incentive for us. We had people walking into the pharmacy who would buy other things as well. And it really started this relationship building with the state patients. So as I say, that was a success here in South Africa, but it has not happened in all of the provinces. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that and for you know, trying to demonstrate to us how incentives can be achieved for the private pharmacies 
uh, to support the scale up of self-care products. I'm then going to shift gears a little bit to, to Brian to talk to us a little bit about in-country relationships and partnerships. Uh, from your experience, what are these relationships and partnerships in country that are key for manufacturers of self-care products? Um, and do you have any suggestions on how manufacturers can strengthen these relationships? Of course, you've really talked a bit about the like, regulatory landscape, which is extremely critical when you talk about entry of products in any country. But are there additional relationships? And, and do you have any suggestions on how this can be strengthened? Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, you, you, I think relationships at all levels is, is really our experience. Um, regulatory landscape, of course, that, that's something that continues to challenge us because every country has slightly different requirements, even although you know, we, the, any product has to be WHO pre-qualified. Once you get it WHO pre-qualified, you then have to go through the registration process in each country and often um, evaluations are needed and that, that tends to prolong the, um, the, the the launch of any product in country. I think the public health provider, the central public health provider is, is key to the provision of the care, in terms, not only in setting policy, but ensuring that in the public space where people are accessing perhaps tests provided by the public sector through pharmacies, um, the product has to be available where and when the people need them. And that's, that's often a logistic challenge, but nevertheless, it's, it's really important. Um, we have found situations where pr our product going into country has sat in a warehouse for months and is not actually being moved down to the um, to the the provinces and and, and the, the various um, remote centres that you know we, we we can help where we can in actually getting that getting that moving. But but that's important. Um, and also because again from a manufacturer standpoint, because self care products, whether they be self tests, self sampling products, or, or other, they, they tend to be country specific in terms of language and and how they're printed. So. The supply chain is really important. If we if we if we don't have forecasting, if we don't have sight of the need in country, then you begin to run the risk of stock out. And 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 I think that sort of relationship to try and see the runway of of, of product supply in country is is really really important. Um, the I mentioned earlier the, the relationships with with pharmacies, pharmacists, and pharmacy society is is again another another important relationship so that we can ensure that when people go to pharmacies and, and, and try and access a product, that the pharmacist can advise them correctly on how the product should be used, some of the limitations perhaps, and act as, as, as a, a go-to point if, if that individual needs, needs more, um, more information. Pricing we mentioned as well. The other thing that it's quite interesting and we're, we're finding we're getting more and more involved in is how we get that message out to the, the consumer that the product is available at certain pickup points because you can get a product into a, into a pharmacy or into a warehouse, but if individuals don't know how to access it or where to access it, then it's not really going to move. Um, and, and, and partnerships with implementing groups and advocacy groups are actually key I think in the in, in the distribution of product and the dissemination of information, um, because it can build an understanding of with with the kind of key population on how the product or uh, service can be accessed, um, and they're able to communicate with a network in a language that that resonates something that's perhaps difficult for us to do, and we have. We have um, partnered with a number of advocacy groups and NGOs um, to, to help get that message out about the importance of self-care and the importance of engaging with the health system, which, let's face it, many people, if they're feeling healthy, don't really do. So I think the whole process needs to be joined up. There's no point in raising awareness if the product supply isn't there and the product isn't into facility. So the whole thing needs to be joined up, that ongoing dialogue. And we, we try to do that personally in country. Um, I have people in, in a number of countries, but also we have a lot of local commercial partners to keep that dialogue on, on ongoing so that um, we can ensure 
that the product's available when people want to access it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to take on from the point where you've talked about you need to join up awareness with the product supply and thinking about this consumer powered, consumer centered care that we're talking about when we think about um, self care. And just direct the next question to Jackie because we want to talk about consumers and the groups. Um, just in a nutshell, who is who is the consumer that is accessing self-care products through the pharmacies? And are there others that we would like to serve through the pharmacies? And are there are those others there in the community that are currently not being um, served? Are there groups and populations that we think could actually benefit from accessing self-care products through pharmacies or through the private sector, but aren't currently doing that, Jackie? And in your view, how, how do we access them uh, in terms of awareness, in terms of use, in terms of even linkage. Okay, so I think, as I've already mentioned, um, in the private pharmacies, um, we certainly service the insured, the 9 million insured people, and then the self-paying or the cash-paying people. And there are many uninsured people who pay for pharmacy services out of their pocket. Um, who, who would we like to see there? Obviously, we would like a much um, broader, um, more equitable uh, system out there. And it was interesting what, what Brian was saying there about uh, marketing and what pharmacies can do. So say, for instance, I said to you that we, we give out about 100,000 um, emergency contraceptives every month. And it's an opportunity you know, to say to somebody who's, who needs this, do you know your status? And if they don't, here's a self-testing kit. You can take it home in the privacy of your own home. Here's one for your partner. Go and test yourself. And, and so you, cre you, you create the demand for these products. But as I was saying, I'd like to see a lot more equity um, so that we don't just serve those that can afford it, but that we could service anybody and everybody. And I think there is a huge market out there. I think once people realize that they can actually do things for themselves, there is um, an incentive to do more. So say, for instance, you say to somebody, um, here's a self-screening test kit. Uh, take it home and use it or take another one, give it to somebody else. Um, these are all examples. And I know that when I, I travel in Uber quite often, and I will very often say to my Uber driver, did you know that there's a tablet to prevent HIV? And how many people don't even know that there is a tablet? They've, they've never heard of PrEP. And so there's, there's this huge market where people could be getting involved in self-care, but they don't know where to get it. So I think as well, um, what one of my colleagues was saying earlier is we need to engage with a lot more advocacy um, in getting it out there. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much. So my last question to the panelists before we turn over to the questions from the audience goes to Mr. Tassi. I think between yourself, Jackie and Brian, it all is going to boil down to some form of coordination, leadership, uh, support and just to go back to a previous conversation around partnerships. Would you share with us two or three things that make private public partnerships engagements possible that we should be looking out for and potentially replicate in other countries? Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, the, the I think the very First thing is, um, like I did say, for you to have the environment, a conducive environment uh, for the private uh, sector to be able to be part of self-care is very, very important. And when I talk about the environment, of course, um, we have issues. We have um, uh, issues like uh, things like the policies. What are your policies like for the country? Um, we, we are moving to, for, for, for self-care, you know? For example, we have, we, have, we have different distribution channels. You have uh, digital platforms, 
we have online pharmacy. Uh, we are actually in Uganda going to also try out accessing self-test kits in the in the in the supermarkets. Yeah, just like condoms. Ah, so once you what's your policy uh, provides a conducive environment for the players to participate uh, and to be able to uh, avail the self-care uh, products without any barriers, then that's already a very big uh, achievement uh, for, for, for the private sector. Um, so what, what are the policies like uh, for the different countries? Yeah. Can they allow, for example, uh, these self-care products to be accessed um, in the non-medical non -medical settings, non-pharmacy settings, like a supermarket for self-test kits, for example? We, we have, uh, for the last many years, been working with community um, uh, health village teams. Uh, I would call them community extension health workers. Uh, and these guys, you know, we, we give them malaria arditis, we give them mal anti-malarials uh, to be able to, for example, take down to the community. Now, under self-care, we also have other people called uh, health entrepreneurs. Now, th these are private uh, practitioners. It's more like a community, mobile pharmacy, I should say. Yeah. So, so, so it's about, number one, the policy of the country to address the environment. Okay, and uh, the environment, the other issue about the environment, conditional environment is the regulation. I, I already said that Uganda will have uh, been able to work with the authorities, National uh, Drug Authority, to be able to bring the approval process uh, uh, period from uh, uh, six months to have a community registered uh, to three months. That is uh, 50%. Then under leadership and governance, of course, but also participation and ownership, we, we have a national um, HIV self-testing task team that, that's for self-testing. And what we did was to co-opt uh, members of the private sector uh, 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 to, to be represented. We had to make sure that there is a representation of uh, the private uh, sector on that uh, national uh, technical working group. So that their contribution, their challenges, uh, their frustrations, uh, uh, um, their achievements are also shared uh, to be able to, uh, to assure that we, we all move uh, uh, smoothly, uh, advancing care uh, uh, for Ugandans. The, the other thing, of course, uh, I, I did mention the issue of resources there in, uh, in the chat window. So someone was asking about uh, information, was asking about uh, counseling and linkage to care, for example, for those who test positive. So one of the things we share across um, uh, uh, some of the resources, we have um, uh, uh, a national toll-free line for HIV self-testing that people can be able to use at any time. This is toll-free, it's 24 hours. It's supported by the government and partners but everyone can use it, uh, both private and public sector. The number is uh, uh, printed on the pack for the self-test and also on the insert. Then we also have other platforms such as digital apps where people can access information. Um, the, the other thing, of course, about the environment, I think we already talked about that, uh, uh, having uh, um, regulation of the, the, the approved products and the, the unapproved ones, assuring that they are, uh, um, there's regulation and enforcement to take out the unapproved uh, products. Then of course, the supply chain, supply chain issues uh, for the, private, the public sector. What's the supply chain for the public sector uh, of these self-care commodities uh, is streamlined. Then you will have, you will not have a lot of problems especially to see your commodities uh, are linked to the private sector, uh, as well as the packaging. We were very clear at the beginning to, to tell Orashua to have a different pack for the private sector and a different pack for the public sector. So that we are uh, partners, we are complementing each other 
uh, and also to avoid abuse of our uh, public sector commodities. And then finally, I think the other thing is look at the private the private sector as equal uh, partners in healthcare, rather than just looking at them as profit profit moguls, but uh, uh, having that partnership uh, and also having them access information. When we develop guidelines, we develop policies, we develop SOPs, they should be shared across the public and the private sector so that they are able to give information. For example, I just typed here in the chat window, information around uh, care and treatment for HIV, information around uh, prevention services such as PrEP, uh, VMMC, uh, condoms, um, a PEP, uh, and the others, so that they are not just uh, um, sellers um, of self-care products, but they can link, they can link um, uh, clients, they can link people to the other services, especially in, in the public sector. Yeah, so, so I think for me, that, that's, that's how I can summarize it, um, mm -hmm. make them part of the TWGs, uh, mm -hmm. work on the environment, but have constant dialogue because each time we, we, we have meetings here, monthly, quarterly, and we keep reviewing our, our performance, uh, we address the challenges, and each one uh, takes up action points that um, they are supposed to act on, uh, and that's how we have kept improving. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Geoffrey, for sharing those great lessons on how to make the partnership work indeed by regarding the private sector as an equal partner. And thank you to our panelists. You have actually given us fantastic lessons from different perspectives based on the discussions that we've just had. I'm going to field uh, a few questions from our audience. Um, and I'm going to direct the first question to Jackie. There's a question from our participants. How do we ensure that pharmacists respond to people's needs and don't impose harmful gender and other social norms? How do we even out the power between pharmacists and the clients? So if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, there is some fear that the pharmacists are not going to act appropriately. So, and I was also listening to what Joffrey was saying there. And, you know, I think if we're looking at any public private partnerships, it's so incredibly important that there are good agreements in place, so service level agreements, so that we know exactly the roles and responsibilities. Because exactly what you're saying, there, there isn't trust. Um, the private sector thinks the government, the state sector is corrupt, and the state sector thinks that the private sector is only out to make profit, where at the end of the day, actually, we all are interested in the health care of the people of the country. Um, as far as the power of the individual going into a pharmacy. So if they did come across any instances where they were not treated with the respect um, that they deserve, uh, certainly in South Africa, our South African Pharmacy Council has got a very efficient complaint system that can be raised there. Um, every pharmacist has a code of conduct that we have to um, respect. And I would hope that if, if you have experienced that, that it, it really is the minority. The average pharmacist out there really deeply cares for the health um, of our patients and our clients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. The next question is to Brian. From your perspective, what advocacy is most needed on self-care national policies to support sales of self-care products? Um, sorry, just on mute myself. Um, I, I think the problem that we see generally is that people don't engage with healthcare providers when they don't feel unwell. And in a number of disease states, this is an issue because by the time people do feel unwell, um, they're usually quite unwell and they do need uh, significant um, help. It, it, the advocacy we're looking for is really to, to, to just raise awareness. 
in the need, certainly in, in, in certain infectious diseases, the need for people to test when they don't feel they don't feel unwell. Um, and it was quite interesting. I took part, in, for example, in a workshop in, in South Africa um, arranged by uh, Higher Health and, and Final Mile. And we were talking and, and focusing on, on um, the HIV situation with, with, with young, young women. Um, and this group had, had run a survey on a, a number of adolescent girls and young women on, on what were the things that concerned them most. And this is in the country with the, you know, the highest HIV burden. And yet HIV didn't, didn't appear at all. Well, I think it was about number 14 on the things that they were concerned. They were concerned with the relationships and all sorts of stuff, um, as normal young girls would be. And it, it kind of brings the point home that people don't generally think about testing. Hepatitis is another. Hepatitis C in particular is another um, burdensome disease state that people just don't test for. So I think that the more we can advocate for people to actually just take time out of their daily lives and, and, and test for infectious diseases that they may not consider that they're, they're susceptible to or they have, um, I think is really, really important. Um, cancer screening is, a, is another one. People just need to engage, and it's universal. They just need to engage with health services and, 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 and test themselves where they get the opportunity because at the end of the day, it could save their life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, what you're pointing out is that there are so many aspects that we need to continue to advocate on. And so um, you've given us a whole array of so many other aspects of self-care that we need to be talking about. I want to thank you all. There were so many great questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go all uh, through all of the questions. Um, we put a link to the new SCTG Frequently Asked Question tool in the chat box that answers many of these tough questions. We'll also make sure to capture these questions from this meeting and share them with our panelists and consider them for future uh, panel discussions. So bear with us. Um, you had great questions. We will be able to answer them in the Frequently Asked Question tool uh, for future discussions. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing the experiences and lessons learned, and also thank each one of you for spending the last one and a half hours listening to us and sharing your thoughts, engaging, and also um, answering questions in this important dialogue on the role of the private sector in advancing self-care. We all know that you're busy and really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to hear from our panelists on the experiences and thoughts on how the private sector can help to advance self-care. I would also like to make a quick plug for the SCTG, the power is in its members. And I'd like to encourage those of you who are not members yet to consider signing up to become a member. The same is true for the RHSC and our Market Development Approaches Working Group. We've dropped the site for you to learn more about both groups and the forms to become members in the chatbot. That way you can hear about our work and future activities to keep this work moving on. I want to thank you so much for being part and parcel of this webinar. And I want to wish all of you a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate the chance to be part of the um, the webinar.